Well, uh, hello again. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for thank you for being here. We're going to start if the photographers will. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I'm uh, Nicolas Barré. I'm the editor in chief of Blazeco, and uh, and of course, very happy to uh, moderate this session. Uh, Jamie uh, Diamond will uh, join us in a few minutes. Uh, we live in, in a time, of course, of uh, fascinating transformation uh, in the financial sector. And this city, Paris, as a financial center, has many assets. And uh, I understand that the new uh, Macron uh, administration is willing to reinforce uh, these assets, in particular in, uh, with some uh, key business initiatives uh, regarding the tax system and the labor uh, system as well. Uh, these are issues I believe the Prime Minister will address uh, later uh, today over, over lunch. Um, we'll have a, a discussion in two parts. Um, first, uh, uh, with uh, our French uh, colleagues and then, uh, and then uh, Jamie and, uh, and uh, Stuart will uh, We'll join the discussion then, uh, for the second part. Uh, Christian Wayer, of course, former governor of uh, the Banque de France. Uh, Ross McInnes, uh, chairman of Safran, and uh, always an uh, enthusiastic ambassador of, uh, of this city and this region as a financial center. And Jean-Louis Laurence, who is the ambassador of uh, the French uh, asset management industry. First, if I may, let's uh, start with you, uh, Christian Noyer. Uh, I mean, th the French government has given to you a mission to uh, look at the opportunities ahead in the financial sector uh, in the face of Brexit in particular. What can you, uh, what can you tell us on that? Well, m thank you very much, uh, Nika. Maybe um, uh, four, four issues uh, I would like to comment very, very shortly. Uh, one is uh, about the, the general challenges of, uh, of Brexit. I mean, the background is um, that a country leaving the European Union is, by definition, leaving the single market. I mean, the single market is basically of the, the logics of the single market, which was very much uh, inspired by excellent uh, reflections at the time in the in the 80s. Uh, by uh, uh, services, and in particular in the United Kingdom, which puts very hard for it, is that when you have a single regulatory landscape, when you have a single judiciary system with the European Court of Justice, then you can have a single market for services regulated by this regulation and, and, and with the, the, the case law, the jurisprudence of, of the same Court of Justice. If you escape from that, then by definition, something is lost and there is nothing you can do. You are a third country and then, then you have to adapt. So the challenge then for the financial industry is to adapt to something which will be the loss of passport. I do not believe that you can find uh, uh, replacements for that. An FTA uh, doesn't cover financial services, nowhere. There's no experience, not the WTO uh, uh, universe. Uh, equivalence is something limited, um, uh, fragile, it can be uh, changed at any time, you cannot build a strategy. So all the financial institutions I've met in the world tell me uh, we have to make, to, to, to make something which is uh, extremely solid to be sure we can continue to service our clients uh, in the future. So that's, that's basically the challenge. Now. Uh, whatever you have to do, and that depends on the precise strategy, the lines of business of each institutions, where to go, and uh, uh, how will, will that uh, be organized. That also depends, of course, of the choice of every institu each institution. Uh, I, I, I think that, uh, of course, in Paris, we have uh, two, two remarks on Paris. I will not comment on other cities. Uh, you may infer uh, by difference, what I what I may think, but it, uh, uh, I'll concentrate, of course, on Paris. Uh, I think uh, in the present moment we have really a game changer. Why? Because uh, the strategy developed by the new president, the new government, and explained clearly by the prime minister will certainly uh, uh, say that more in details in a in a moment. Uh, but um, is to tackle all the main weaknesses that have uh, 
uh, seen in my discussions over the last nine months. Uh, first and foremost, the labor market rules. Frankly speaking, after the reform that is being planned, uh, France will have by far, in my view, uh, the most uh, uh, um, uh, flexible labor market rules apart from the UK and, and probably Ireland, uh, but for the rest of Europe will, will be at the, at, the, at the best level. That's really a game changer, and it's, it really meets all the precise things that I've been told would, would need to be improved or fixed in, in France um, during my, all, all my contacts. Um, and on taxation, of course, not only is there a clear view of something more business friendly, something stable over the next uh, uh, five years, uh, but uh, more precisely, uh, the things that are being addressed, uh, be it in the, in the field of, uh, of the level of corporate tax, of um, uh, reducing the, 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 the cost imposed on wages with the uh, payroll tax, uh, which is going to be diminished, um, uh, or uh, uh, all the things, uh, clarification about the uh, uh, financial transaction tax, the intraday disappears, that was totally inapplicable, but it was something, uh, uh, it, it, w it was a problem in the, in the landscape. Uh, by the way, uh, clarifying also that uh, any idea of European financial tax should be uh, discussed after the Brexit uh, in, in agreement with Germany. My personal view is that this is inapplicable and totally impossible uh, unless you do something globally. I mean, if, if you do that at the OECD level, it's fine. Uh, doing that at the European level doesn't make much sense. Doing that at the level of 10 countries it makes absolutely no sense, but that's, that's a personal view. Um, but of course, on top of all this, this game change, uh, we'll still have the, uh, the, the, the fundamental um, um, strengths of, of the Paris financial place that is uh, uh, the only global e uh, financial ecosystem apart from London in Europe. Um, probably the best regulators we have on the continent. Uh, I, I remind, for those who forgot, that France was on one of the very rare countries which went through the crisis without the taxpayer paying a single penny uh, for the banking system. So that's, that's something which shows uh, that the way we're organized and the quality of regulators is, is extremely high. Uh, but the most important probably for Paris is the talent pool. And the talent pool is such that we have hundreds of thousands of French citizens working in the city. Uh, today they go to the city. Some of them tomorrow will probably uh, stay in Paris. It's, it's easy to uh, attract them in Paris at a cost that is uh, basically much, much lower than when you have to, uh, to hire them uh, in other European countries. Uh, and that's the major asset. There are many other things, but, but uh, I will I have to be, to be, to be short. Um, not to forget perhaps one thing, which is the openness to innovation, the capacity of the industry, a little bit like in London, uh, to work together with a central bank, uh, with the finance ministry, uh, with the regulators in general, uh, to deal with uh, financial innovation and find appropriate responses and adaptations. Uh, on the way it will organize, that's my uh, third, third comment, uh, of the, the transition or well the, the, the change will be organized by financial institutions. Uh, just a word of caution on the interpretation of, of some announcements that have been made by financial institutions because what they tell me is that we might decide, depending on the institution, to uh, put our legal hub in another country. It does not mean that we will not uh, um, put our uh, trading room in the EU in Paris because of the pool of talents, because of all the things that I just mentioned and many others. And it may end that uh, the real workforce and the real center of activities for, especially for market activities, uh, might, be, might be in Paris for many institutions which have uh, already declared that they might uh, choose another city for their, for their hub. Uh, last, last comment um, 
on infrastructures and, and clearing. Uh, they also, I mean, the, the basic problem for the EU is a problem of financial stability. Uh, can you have, uh, can you totally rely on, uh, it's not negative what I'm saying, but an offshore place where uh, you have no regulatory power, no judiciary power, no supervisory power, or very fragile one shared with others uh, for uh, the bulk of, of clearing uh, and a place where you have no access to central bank money. Well, to me, this is, this is really dangerous. Now, having said that, and that explains why there is a debate on that, there are things that can be easily moved and are already being moved. If you take the clearing of repos, it's largely uh, transferred already from London to Paris on the for the Euro contract, uh, and it's going to be finished well before the Brexit uh, takes place, uh, I believe. Uh, the CDS uh, clearing, that's also developing in Paris. It's the same group which has merged uh, the clearing of, uh, of London and Paris, so it's relatively easy for them to organize. The question is more difficult for the uh, uh, for the, 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 the swap, the, the interest rate future, uh, the, the derivatives contract, uh, that's going to be discussed. I think that uh, it's difficult to imagine in the medium term or long term that 100% of this contract is, uh, is outside the EU, but that's, that's going to be discussed. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Christian. Um, Ross, let me turn to you. Um, you meet executives all around the world. You travel all the time. Uh, you meet executives in London as well. What do they tell you about Paris and what is lacking? I think um, Christian's talked about some of the uh, regulatory and strengths. Prime Minister will talk about some of the uh, uh, fiscal and labor law measures which are going to be enacted. Uh, the dialogue I tend to have, and including with bank senior bankers together with, uh, with Christian, tends to be about uh, customers and people. Um, if you come to Paris and Ile de France, you have a real economy. Uh, before being kicked upstairs to the chairman, chairmanship job, I was CFO for 20 years. Uh, in Paris, you have sophisticated financial markets, which you have customers, you can go which cater financial markets which cater from CAC 40 companies to startups. They're all here uh, in, in this area. Uh, and that has generated already in Paris, Christian alluded to it, uh, a very strong ecosystem, which is world class. That's made up of the availability of real estate, but also people, back to people again, uh, the professions, consultants, lawyers, accountants. That's what you need if you're going to move people uh, to a major financial center. They have to have customers to talk to, and they have to have, uh, they have, to have the ability uh, to hire people and, and we have in Paris, Ile-de-France, uh, that talent pool. And then you have to, your staff have to want to come here. Uh, and for them to want to come here, they're going to have to, you're going to have to house them. Uh, you're going to have to have uh, jobs for their spouses. That's back to the, to the ecosystem. Uh, and you're also going to have schools for their children. Uh, because it's very hard to persuade people who are Italian or, or Spanish or Japanese uh, to move somewhere where they won't be able to educate their children in the system uh, they've been used to. And then finally, you have to have a pool of talent from which to recruit. And for all the reasons I've just mentioned in terms of the our educational system, uh, we also have that talent pe pe pool available for people. And that message is the one we, uh, we convey. And you know, if I would, you know, I'd sum it up uh, uh, in a nutshell, I think we t when we talk to senior bank uh, executives, uh, the, we urge them to consider somewhere where there are customers they can talk to, where there are schools they can educate their children, and incidentally, somewhere they can go out for dinner which doesn't close at nine o'clock. And so do they buy the message? I, well, you, well we, you, you can ask both Jamie Diamond has arrived and Stuart Gulliver what they think of those points. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Louis Laurence, one, one of the great strength of Paris uh, as a financial center is, uh, is its assets management um, industry. Uh, I mean, but no position is granted forever. Uh, so what do we need to do to, uh, to keep this strength here? Yes, good morning, everyone. 
over the last six months or so, I have uh, met one way or another uh, close to 200 asset managers using London as a hub to access the European Union. The first thing to say is that we have now realized that uh, it won't be able to continue like that post-Brexit, so we have to uh, reinforce their presence in the EU. And um, when you think about it, there are if essentially four things that matter for asset managers when they have to make a, a relocation decision. The first thing is access to clients. Uh, of course, uh, accessing the EU uh, clients mean uh, requires to have a passport, uh, but also to be uh, geographically in a location where you can access as many clients as possible. And there, there is no question that Paris not only has a large domestic base of clients, it's the second largest asset management market after the UK in, in Europe with 3.8 trillion euros of assets under management, and Paris has clients locally. Uh, but also, uh, from Paris, you can uh, see any of your clients within a couple of hours by train or by, or by plane. It's the only location where you can do that from. So location is important uh, to access clients. The second uh, element, particularly in an indus industry which is challenged by new technologies, by uh, margin pressures, by uh, uh, the uh, rising proportion of uh, passive management versus active, so you have to have access to talents. Uh, it was already said by uh, my friends there, but uh, uh, talents, uh, we have a unique pool of talents in Paris. Our schools and universities, for the best ones, they produce mathematically trained people, uh, computer programmers, and this is exactly what uh, asset managers need uh, and will need more and more for the future as the business will become more technologically, technologically driven or mathematically driven. So access to talents. Third uh, component is to have a regulator which is uh, efficient and business friendly. And I have to say that uh, uh, the AMF now, with their fast track processes, uh, I usually quote this number of 17, 17 working days, which is the maximum time that the AMF takes to approve a new fund. There's also this famous two week uh, track to uh, convert or to, to obtain a license to operate as an asset manager in France when you have been licensed by the F FCA. So in two weeks, you get your French license. We have probably the most efficient regulator now, and this in this industry, it is particularly important. It takes you at least 90 days in Dublin or in Luxembourg to have a new product approved. You have to use lawyers. In Paris, you go direct, and in less than a month, it's done. The last point is cost um, management and cost reduction in particular. And I'm really talking about cost reduction because our industry is challenged, as I said, by uh, pressure on margins from all sorts of, uh, of uh, sources. Uh, and managing costs is where, uh, of course, Paris is not obvious instantaneously, instantaneously in people's mind, particularly as they're concerned about indirect labor cost, about uh, uh, lack of, uh, of visibility in the, uh, in the tax system. Uh, and this is where we have a lot of, uh, uh, of teaching to do and a lot of uh, explaining to, to make. But Paris has also some major advantages in, in terms of taxation beyond what is going to be announced and what has already been announced, um, uh, which is the uh, Crédit Impôt Recherche, the uh, uh, research tax credit, which really makes Paris a very natural place to locate your research teams. Uh, and again, it's going to be more and more important in the future. Uh, on, labor uh, on the labor cost side, it is really uh, a perception of lack of flexibility and indirect labor cost that still is there. Uh, and it's, it, it explains why some of the decisions to relocate sort of more labor intensive activities have been already taken, uh, not in favor of Paris. Uh, and there will always be the odd uh, firm that will take the quick win or low cost decision to uh, use a kind of letterbox somewhere. Uh, and this is where, of course, the EU has to be a little bit uh, uh, careful and consistent uh, to uh, make sure that uh, asset managers to which we will give in the future a passport allowing them to manufacture and distribute products everywhere in Europe will have enough substance to justify uh, owning this passport. Otherwise, you could have some kind of race to uh, compete for the lowest uh, uh <laughs> requirements of country. And why not Romania becoming a hub for passport for, for letterboxes giving you access to Europe? So, so uh, sorry for my Romanian friends, but uh, uh, I just take this as an example to avoid mentioning other countries. Uh, so um, I think we've having said all that. France has really uh, uh, major, uh, major cards in its hands to uh, attract asset management uh, firms that will have to uh, relocate at least partially from London to the continent in order to continue to have access to this EU market, which, as we heard again this morning,
between CMU and PEP will be more and more a single market, a, a single savings market with a lot of growth potential, one which you cannot avoid where you have to be present. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Stuart Gulliver, uh, HSBC is uh, headquartered in, uh, in the UK, of course. Uh, how do you intend to respond to uh, Brexit? What's your uh, strategy on that? Sure. Well, obviously, at the moment, we don't know what shape Brexit will take. So I think it's important not to think of this as binary, i.e. everything is in London today and everything will be in Paris, Frankfurt, somewhere else tomorrow. Um, the specific specificity around how Brexit takes place will define how institutions respond. So there's more likely to be fragmentation than simply a binary move of the entire London Financial Centre move somewhere else. We've analysed on the basis of hard Brexit, so out of the single market, out of the customs union, um, and there's about 1,000 jobs out of the 43,000 that, that we employ in the UK that will be unlawful for that activity to be carried out from the UK if it's hard Brexit. And we've been very public about the fact that we will move those jobs to Paris. Now, why Paris? Um, well, first of all, we acquired uh, Credit Commerce de France in 2002. Charles de Quesse is here in the front, 2000. Thank you, Charles. Um, and therefore have 9,500 French colleagues and actually employ about another 1,500 French nationals uh, in the other 68 countries we operate in around the world. So, so France for us is, we have a bank here, we have critical mass. We also recognize that there is a very significant critical mass of real economy companies here. So your point about Ile de France is extremely well made. Um, there also is a strong regulatory environment. France didn't actually use taxpayer money at any point during the financial crisis. And you've got big complex banks. And actually you've also got a banking system that's profitable. So if you look at some other European countries, the banking system effectively is nationally owned. I'm thinking here of Germany, where the Sparkassen, Landers Bank, and KFW dominate, and it's been very hard to find a substantially profitable German bank through the cycle. So again, you want to be in a country where the banks themselves are profitable. But obviously, the package of reforms that were suggested last week is very, very positive for France if they're enacted, because if you're sitting in someone else's shoes, and as I say, we don't have to choose a country because we have, if you like, pre-chosen by acquiring CCF many, many years ago. You're obviously going to consider whether or not that package of reforms will stay, i.e. it's very early within the new presidency and people will still have very fresh in their minds that President Hollande declared that finance is the enemy. There were demonstrations, there was a very high tax rate. So are we now on the verge of 10 years because large companies like ours need to plan for a long period of time? Will that environment in terms of particularly labor laws actually stick through at least two presidential cycles before making those decisions? So, so the thing I think that is, is, is most important is that, that the sense of confidence that this is a, a complete sea change yeah. in the approach to the but labor. How, are, how confident are you on these, uh, on these issues? So, so, so I would say that we are still in the very early stages of, mm. of, of assessing the extent to which to, to be blunt, there may well be a second term for the current administration. Because mm -hmm. generally speaking, looking elsewhere around the world, strong leadership for two terms affects significant change. Um, we are optimistic, and as I say, we've been very public about a thousand of the 43,000 jobs in the UK would come here, and not anywhere else, for, for the reasons I've just set out. But there is that, um, that um, the governor and others will have come across when they're talking to bankers in other locations as to why you know, if you're Japanese, if you're American, would you move to France versus, as I say, the way we will tackle it. But I would stress again, you know, if Brexit turns out to be soft Brexit, it may not be a thousand. At the moment, we actually don't know what the shape it would be. We've basically done our analytics on the worst case. The worst case is a thousand roles move here, 42,000 stay in the UK, and our employment here will be up at about 10, 10 and a half thousand. So what kind of changes does it, uh, will you uh, implement in your organization? Is, is it uh, looking forward? Is it minor changes or uh, is it more uh, fundamental? So, so I think actually it's, the, the, the thing is we have always kept a substantial French operation. So our Euro government bond trading platform has always remained in Paris. We never moved mm. it to London. So we've always run effectively with a substantial presence here in France. So for us, for HSBC, it's less significant and structural than it may be for other institutions. 
what kind of scenario do you uh, do you see for uh, for Brexit? You, you I mean, I if you uh, had to, uh, if I ask you to project yourself in in, in a year or two, uh, how how do you? So, so, so the only thing I can do for my shareholders is to work mm. on the assumption it's hard Brexit, mm. because it's quite clearly the will of the British people, and that will be followed through. And we need to work on, if you like, the. Um, the, the most extreme version of it, which is hard Brexit. And that's the analytic that says, within our wholesale banking business in the UK, about 19% of the revenues in that business in the UK will be at risk. We will need to be able to service those clients. To service those clients, we will need to move these people here. And therefore, we hope to be able to continue to service the clients. Remember, banks only exist if they have clients. So we need to organize ourselves in such a way that we can provide continuity to European companies. The, there was a story the other day in the, in the British press saying that uh, a thousand lawyers uh, had registered in Ireland. Uh, would you say that Dublin is a destination for, uh, could be a destination for uh, finan some financial activities out of London? So we have about five from London. Yeah. To, uh, so look, we have Ireland. about 500 people in Dublin, and we do a lot of our um, back office and custodian securities work there. Um, up and we will continue to um, employ people in Dublin. We won't be moving jobs from Dublin to another location. But for us, um, as I say, because we have this bank here in it's France, French, which uh, has all of the licenses, to it's not just that, it's not historical. The bank here in France has all of the licenses and passports required to carry out business with the EU27 already today. Therefore, it would be actually irrational for us to look at another location. Okay. So you were you were ready for Brexit even before we started talking about Brexit in, in that sense. By total luck, as opposed to design. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, a genius moment, obviously. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you said you could be blunt, so uh, let's let's move forward. Uh, what what is what is lacking in in Paris for Paris to be a, 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 a bigger uh, financial centre? So, so I really. I do think it's around, um, it is around labor laws and the reform of labor laws, uh, less so around... This is going to change. But if this changes, then it's very, very positive. Mm. Absolutely positive. I mean, the, the, the financial, the banking industry is quite cyclical. Um, it does actually um, have less stable employment than other sectors. Um, the ability to be able to manage a cost base through a cycle is quite important. In places like London, Hong Kong, New York, there is tremendous flexibility around that. You are moving to that. The reforms that I saw, as which I say, I think are very, very good for France, yeah, including things like not including deferred compensation when you look at bankers and so on in terms of, of, of how you would deal with redundancy payments is a very important step forward. So I think France is marching towards it. But again, people will want to see this stick for a period of time. We're very early in the new administration and the, the previous administration is very, very fresh still in people's minds, I would imagine. We need proof that we won't uh, change our minds again. Yeah. It sounds like a very large dog just behind us here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more uh, broadly speaking, uh, what, what would you say Brexit means for uh, the rest of Europe in terms of uh, the construction of, uh, of the EU and uh, of this uh, political project or um, economic project. <coughs> so, so again, you what you does it really change? So, so don't forget, you're, you're asking a, a British national looking in from outside here. Um, I would imagine, depending on how the German election result takes place, there may well be an opportunity for Germany and France to come closer together, mm -hmm. and you may start to see some inner circles. You may get harmonization of tax between a couple of countries. But, but I would agree with the governor that doing this across 10, 27 doesn't make sense. So, so, and I would have thought that actually Brexit ought to, one hopes, catalyze further commitment to the capital markets union, crystallize, uh, catalyze further commitment to the EU project overall. So, so I don't necessarily see this as the start of further fragmentation. It actually ought to be the catalyst for probably, as I say, a core group of companies, countries, being closer together. Okay, and a capital market that would function Capital markets union is really In Europe. Yes. So in that sense, Brexit would achieve what the British were asking Europeans to there do. There would be a certain irony to that, yes. Oh. Uh, uh, and there's also a, a, a broader question, which is uh, 
would you say that uh, what's happening in the, in the UK could uh, make some financial activities move out of Europe? And I mean, we've talked about, of course, about New York, but also uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and other other centres. Is, is it a threat for for Europe as a whole to? Uh, to so, so I think that's a really good question. So I think there is a definite possibility that um, some activities go to New York, and some activities go to Singapore and Hong Kong rather than come onto the continent. But are but you seeing that? Uh, I mean, so so again, we're we're a couple of years away. So n I would imagine that people will be making plans for such activities as opposed to necessarily executing them at this point in time. So, so I'll tell you a thing that would do this. So this whole issue around Euro clearing, central counterparty clearing. Remember, all these central counterparties are private institutions. They're heavily regulated. They concentrate massive financial risk. So, so if, if Euro clearing is moved here, that has a tremendous negative effect on the netting that can take place within a, a central counterparty. It increases significantly, probably by 20, 25% the initial margin. It increases the cost. But if euros are going to be cleared near the ECB, then logically dollars should be cleared in New York. So you start to get that fragmentation taking place. Um, so I think it is quite likely that New York will be a beneficiary of this. I think it is quite likely that Hong Kong will be a beneficiary. I also, though, strongly believe that London will remain a very big financial centre. It will, however, have a different shape because obviously those activities covered by USITS and MIFID and so on will be based in the, in the European Union. But I don't see the foreign exchange market moving. I don't see the equity market moving. I don't see investment grade corporate bonds or high yield bonds moving for the simple reason that the UK will retain its position in terms of rule of law, language, um, concentration of, of skills around dual point accountants and lawyers and so on and so forth, um, and actually will remain obviously anchored with a, a core set of, of skills which will remain. So remember when the UK did not enter the euro, the thought was that actually London would lose its preeminent position as a foreign exchange centre. It didn't. So, so I think that what would also be a mistake to write off London as a financial centre. I think we get fragmentation actually taking place. Do you think there's still room for a, a compromise on, um, on clearing uh, in the sense that, I mean, clearing would, would be done not only in continental Europe, but also that th there would be a compromise with, with the UK on that, or is it too late? Well, is it it, it's possible. Because but, of, of but the but political pressure and... Uh, uh, it, it, it's possible, um, but, but the key thing will be about provision of liquidity. It is about access to a central bank that has the ability to provide liquidity behind the system. Whether that's the Bank of England, the ECB, or the Fed, that's going to be the critical point. So yeah, it's possible you get fragmentation, but don't forget, fragmentation means less netting, higher initial margins, greater cost to the real economy. Because the cost of all of this gets eventually translated through to companies and therefore to the man in the street through the cost of goods and services. Jimmy Diamon, thank you for being here. Um, you're probably, your institution is probably the most uh, European American bank. Uh, how do you look at all these uh, issues around Brexit and what does it change for, uh, for your institution? So, well, so welcome everybody. Sorry, I was told to be here at 11.30, so if I'm late, I apologize. Um, so I, I agree with Stuart on most things. Uh, you know, we have to be prepared for hard Brexit. So whether you think it's going to happen or don't think it's going to happen, that is the planning. As it turns out, it's easy to be planned for that. All it means is that several hundred jobs or hundreds of jobs have to legally be done through an EU sub. Okay, so we have bank brand, we have banks and subsidiaries in Frankfurt, uh, Dublin, uh, Luxembourg that can actually do most of our activities. But I think there's a huge focus on that first step. That first step, there's going to be a second step, and I think people should focus more on the second step because people, how many jobs you move in and stuff like that. What happens next is totally up to the EU. It's not up to Britain, okay? And so once you have that first step, if the EU determines over time that they want to start to move a lot more jobs uh, out of London into the EU, they can simply dictate that. The regulators can dictate it, and the politicians can dictate it. And so there may be this uh, agreement, regulatory equivalency, and all things like that, and all those jobs can stay in the UK. We have 16,000 people in the UK, but think of it as, you know, 75% of that is servicing EU companies. 
uh, and I, you know, if regulators say one day, we don't, we're not comfortable, you risk people, your lawyers, your compliance, uh, being in the UK, they can make us move it. So we, we will simply be subject to what they do down the road, and hopefully we can handle that and continue to serve our clients uh, in the meantime. But more specifically, what, what will it change for your uh, organization? Nothing. We're going to move several hundred jobs, and that tomorrow we can do a bond deal or a trade with someone, a European counterparty. Mm -hmm. on that's on day one. Then this negotiation will happen. We'll, you know, we don't know how the, the face of it, uh, but after day one, you know, which is the end of Brexit, we don't know what's going to happen. And so we will have to be prepared to do more after that, and we'll, we'll wait and see. But our, our primary focus is serving our clients on day one. We want to make sure that if there's a hard Brexit, we can still bank. You know, remember, we bank companies, governments uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, so we want to be in a position to be able to do that. What, uh, from, from your perspective, what are the strengths and, and weaknesses of Paris as a financial center? Well, yeah, I think you've heard it here. There are obviously, it's a beautiful city. Uh, it's got uh, education, it's Thank got you. universities, it's got technology, it's got uh, 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 a new president, I think, who is, I think is great, that you know, the president's talking about entrepreneurship and growth and jobs, and uh, it's nice to be wanted. They want the financial Former services. Former banker, business. by the way. What? Former banker, by the way, the president. Yes, I saw. He worked at a ba uh, an investment bank, and so, uh, so obviously it has a, l has a lot going for it. And the other thing to keep in mind is where your legal entity is based does not mean where your people are based. Mm. And so people are mistaking that too. So we have said that we'll probably use a Frankfurt bank because we have the licenses already, we have the bank already, and we may have to beef up some of its uh, capital and some of the licenses it has, but the people could be in Paris or Netherlands or Madrid or anywhere in the EU. So we haven't decided yet, and we're, we're here to talk to people, and we're, our eyes, our ears are wide open, and Stuart said the most important thing, you got, we, ha we, we have to have, this is not just important for banks, it's important for economies. Consistency, rule of law, stability, steadfast, uh, that's what's important for economies. So it's not just important for banks, it's important for all economies. If you look at economies around the world, those countries that have been inconsistent, no rule of law, all these other problems, you know, flip-flopping, they're just not conducive to growth. And remember, that hurts average citizens. And, and I think that people have to focus, it hurts average citizens. So I think this, this government's made enormous leeway and we're here to listen to them and, and hopefully uh, maybe this will be a place we put, put a lot of people. In the meantime, the s hundreds we move will probably be a little bit dispersed. What's in, in, a, in a broader sense, what are the uh, opportunities that you see in Europe? How do you s look at Europe today? And yeah, so um, you know, Europe, obviously, it's the second, you know, I, my view of the Euro, the EU and the monetary union, I actually think is one of the great human achievements of all time. You know, for this continent to have been through centuries of wars, et cetera, to try to get together and live in peace and resolve their differences politically, I think it's a wonderful thing. I think the uh, common market was also a wonderful thing because you look across the United States or you look at China today, having one large market is a huge competitive advantage for the economies and the people in those economies. Both of those things kind of got bogged down a little bit in bureaucracy and politics and they, it, they weren't completed. You still don't have complete a banking union and all these various things that make those things happen. I think the better thing is to finish that. I think the more they do that, the healthier the economy will be. I think being pro-business is very good for Europe. So that I think your, your new president, you know, he, this is a linchpin. When the Brexit happened, you know, our great fear, if you look at the bookends, the great fear is that it caused the EU to tear apart. And that, you know, there were, there were legitimate problems that the Brits, Brits were complaining about. And that you, if that exhibits itself over and over, you know, the EU might not have survived. And so uh, the other, on the other side was that maybe it would cause uh, the po political leaders to say, hey, let's acknowledge the flaws that are embedded in the EU and start to fix them. And that's, it seems to me that uh, your president and uh, Angela Merkel, that's what they're starting to do, is look at these issues and try to make it more competitive. The more they do that, the better it's the citizens of Europe, uh, the companies in Europe, and the opportunities, obviously, for any commercial enterprise, including banks. What, what are these flows, would you say, in the, in the, in, in the euro? Oh, I, you know, I think, um, I think that, I mean, and, you know, people voted for Brexit, and that's clear that, that the British people spoke. I don't think the British people know exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. So they were voting to get out of something. I'm not sure they know what they're voting to get into. And, and so 
But I think the, the complaints were around who controls your borders, what's going to happen to the, the culture of my nation, uh, uh, the, the looking at Brussels, is it really democratic when it starts to dictate, you know, overregulate the administrative state, uh, kind of anti-business sentiment, all these various things. Uh, and so I think that, you know, people were voting for different things. The young people in Britain wanted to stay. You know, so the, the, the future of the people, the people it really matters to, wanted to stay. And they just didn't come out and vote. You know, I mean, what is it, was 40% of the population voted? And 53% voted to, to exit? So let's, let's be honest about what that means. It means a lot of people didn't vote, and a lot of people don't even know what they voted for. <laughs> Would you, would you say that would you say that the euro will emerge on the long term will emerge stronger uh, after Brexit and uh the the euro it's got nothing to do with Brexit it has to do with the rules and uh, law and decisions made in the EU over the next 50 years mm -hmm. so if the EU currency is to survive you have to do, they have to do certain things to make it survive. And they have to look at how you can uh, have transfer payments between countries. You know, you, you're not gonna have some country borrowing, you know, X amount, another country borrowing half the amount, some going to 5%, and some going to 1%, and think that the euro will survive long term. It will not. I'm talking about 30, 40 years. I'm not talking about next year. Well, I, I asked the question to, uh, to Stuart about, um, you know, some financial activities moving out of, of Europe. And we talked about New York City as a yeah. possible destination. How do you see that? You're an American banker. Yeah, I, I um, you know, first of all, our preference is to stay right where we are. You know, London's been a good home, other than the fact they overtax us, uh, and they put in that unfair bank tax, which you know, to me, should be removed. Um, but but we liked it just the way it is. But it's not up to us. We simply have to respond to uh, decisions that are made by governments. The preference, if we move these people into Europe, is that it, that it function well, and a lot of those things will simply be done, some in the UK and some in Europe. The, I don't think the United, you know, the, uh, Asia is going to do well on its own, because Asia is going to grow faster than the rest of the world. I think the United States will be a very small beneficiary if the politicians here negotiate the right deal between the UK and Europe. And I think if Europe does well, most of the stuff that will be done in the UK, if it moves, will be done in Europe. There might be pockets that get picked up in the United States, but I wouldn't consider it substantial. Would you say that um, President Trump's uh, policies uh, are favorable for the financial sector? Yeah, well, it depends what you look at. So it, policies which are conducive to growth are favorable to all commercial sectors. Okay, it is obvious, and this is a kind of a global thing, that corporate tax reform is important. As a matter of fact, a lot of the European nations figured that out way before America did. I was in Dublin last week. They understand how important corporate taxes are, and they understand how important they are, not to the corporation, but to the citizens of the nation. And I think politicians have to acknowledge it's important to competitiveness in the nation, and you know, a competitive economy actually accrues to the people of the nation, not to the corporation themselves directly. I think infrastructure is critical. I think a lot of you travel around the world. If you looked at you know, American infrastructure, you'd say, my God, you guys should, should, you should do better than that. And yes, we should, and we should get around that. And then regulatory reform, I think, broadly in the United States, whether it's financial or otherwise, uh, is important to do. So those things will be conducive to growth in America. And uh, you know, there are other policies which could be not conducive to growth, depending on how trade turns out, uh, et cetera. Uh, the corporate tax reform that President Trump uh, wants to uh, implement, will it actually take place? Uh, it, it's going to be difficult to pass through Congress. So what's your, uh, what's your take on that? What's your view? How do you uh, anticipate that? Yeah, so the, uh, the American tax rate is now the highest in the world. And that's whether you look at the statutory rate or the effective rate. And it has been driving capital and brains overseas for a decade. How the American government, now the, the, this administration gets it, how they didn't get it before completely amazes me. It's been driving capital and brains overseas, and that it also makes it far more competitive for a foreign company to buy an American company, for an American company to invest overseas, which is why American companies have $2 trillion of cash, and they've invested, I think, another trillion has been invested overseas. Had that been free to move back and forth, you know, a good chunk of that would have 
gone to a, a higher and better use in the United States. So the administration is devoted to corporate tax reform. So are the Republicans in the Senate, the Republicans in the House. If you talk to them, they talk about they are devoted to getting this done in the fall. As you know, it is very hard to do. I'm not an expert. It has to go mm. through Congress. They're going to need 51 votes. There are all these uh, constraining laws and requirements about uh, pay for and what kind of deficit it creates. I personally don't think the focus should be on the short-run deficit. I don't think that's important. I think doing something that's conducive to growth is more important. So I'm, I'm hoping it gets done. I just don't know the odds. I'd be guessing. But is if it, it doesn't get done, it will be bad, again, for the, you know, the economic future of American citizens, not banks. And uh, always keep that in mind. It'll be bad for the, if you look at America, our middle class income has been flat for years because of some of these bad policies. It is mm. incumbent upon the politician to fix it to help the average American, not to help the bank. We, we're talking about huge sums of money uh, here. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a key issue for the US, of course, uh, as, you, as you explained, but also for uh, foreign economies because if these uh, capital flows go back to the US, then it will have a huge impact on uh, uh, in Europe and, and elsewhere. How, how do you see that? Yeah, not, I don't think, uh, you gotta be- You're talking about trillions. Well, there's two trillion of cash here yeah. that American companies have, and if it was all freed up somehow to move back to the United States, I don't think two trillion would go. I think we, we think a number would go, maybe half a trillion to a trillion or something like that. But a lot of those funds are sitting here idle too. They haven't all been, you know, cash hasn't been put to work. So it isn't like you have an immediate overnight effect. So I think you'll, it, there'll be some effect from it. I don't think there's anything that Europe should be afraid of. I also think if America grows faster, that's good for Europe too. You know, getting growth in America, getting a little bit faster would be good for all the European nations. So, you know, we have a common interest to, to make you know, the world economy grow faster. I think the moral imperative is to get the world to grow faster. That, that's the moral imperative. You know, a lot of the negatives you see are because we don't have enough growth to support social programs and, and uh, building middle class wages. And so we, we need to do that. And so I think it's important that governments focus on that. There's also another big issue regarding uh, President Trump, which is trade. Uh, is it something that worries you, the, the way he uh, deals with uh, these issues? I think, uh, you know, when uh, President Trump was elected, uh, I think there was a lot of trade rhetoric in the election. I think if you listen very closely and look at actions since then, it hasn't been quite been the rhetoric. And, you know, in the book he wrote, The Art of the Deal, he always kind of throws out something way out here, but he is a negotiator, wants to get something done. I am told by the people in the administration, P I was in China recently, that they're negotiating. And I believe they're negotiating with Mexico. I am a believer in trade, okay? And I think trade's been very good for the globe. I do think there are circumstances, and you know, we didn't, we collectively didn't do a good job. It does have negatives. It did leave some people behind. We should have had better trade assistance and adjustment and income assistance. And so I think we need to do that in the United States and maybe other parts of the world. But if I had to guess, they're gonna do trade deals. There are legitimate problems with the trade deals. So when the president laid out you know, all these unfair things you know, with NAFTA and particularly with China, well, you know what, that's accurate. A lot of those things are accurate. And you know, so I think it's perfectly legitimate for an American president to say, you know, this uh, subsidized state-owned enterprises, uh, uh, tar you know, tariffs, much higher tariffs, non-tariff barriers, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we can't buy a bank in China. They can buy banks around the world. You know, to look at that, but I think the Chinese are gonna negotiate. I think they're gonna look at it and say, yeah, we, we should have maybe done a little bit more here or there. I think it's in their interest to do some of this, by the way. So I think they're, you know, they're becoming a developing nation. It's their interest to move ahead and make progress in trade. So I'm optimistic. I understand the words can scare you. I'd like to ask uh, both of you, Stuart and, and Jamie, um, two questions. One on uh, your view of the global economy, how it's moving, and, uh, and secondly, how do you see the monetary policy uh, uh, in, in uh, before the end of, of, of this year? Uh, but first, the global economy, how do you see that? Um, so, so we see Asia growing actually at a reasonable pace. Um, we've been consistent in our views that China is not going to have a hard landing. Uh, that's been correct so far. There's been a kind of view that China will have a hard landing for probably six, seven years now. That's not turned out to be the case. So we think Chinese GDP will be growing at about 6%, which will actually lift the rest of Asia. Um, China's commitment to the Belt and Road Initiative, to RCEP, which replaced the TPP as a regional free trade agreement, 
will also drive economic growth there. So we think Asia-Pacific grows reasonably well, actually. And the demographics are very powerful. So don't forget, again, demographics are a, a very um, significant part that sits behind economic growth. I mean, it's a young population. Um, so therefore, again, for, for economic growth around the world, China growing strongly is actually in, in everyone's interest. Middle East is going reasonably well, notwithstanding the fact there are obviously a, a, a political tensions there. But again, if you look at our numbers, that's reasonable. Um, I think the, the, the UK outlook is, is, is uncertain. Um, and obviously, um, there are some inflationary pressures from the weaker pounds coming through. And there's the uncertainty of the political negotiations that will take place around Brexit. Europe looks reasonable. The United States does appear to be growing at a reasonably brisk pace. And I agree with Jamie. What we need is, you know, the EU is, what, 650 million people. The United States, China, if all three of these economies grow well, everyone benefits. Okay, so if we are looking for how do we fund social programs, et cetera, you know, it's through economic activity which increases the fiscal take, which actually results in greater funds being available to lift the more um, underprivileged parts of societies across the world. So, so actually, I think this year we'll, we will see reasonably good economic growth across the piece. Therefore, we started to see a change in monetary policy in the United States, because clearly there are, you know, US is operating with near full employment. And therefore, one can expect to see the, the response that the Fed has already put in place. Um, we would also, and this is very specific to HSBC, expect to see Hong Kong interest rates move up because the mm -hmm. currency is pegged to the US dollar. Um, the UK, you know, um, Governor Carney started to signal the fact that we're reaching a point where the UK may need to consider higher rates. The Eurozone is probably stuck with low rates for yeah. a little while longer. Um, but, but I think we are at that inflection point where there's some evidence of inflation and some evidence of you know, employment numbers being good and also some evidence of the commodity cycle beginning to turn back up because a lot of the oversupply that came about because the mining companies did huge capex in anticipation of China forever growing at you know, 8, 9, 10% GDP, that overcapacity is being worked through the system. So I actually think the outlook is reasonably okay, quite honestly, mm. from an economic perspective. Jamie? Yeah, so a uh, quick walk around the world. China, I agree with Stuart, you know, should meet its objectives of growing 6.5%. I'll talk a little bit later about one problem that is there that we should keep our eye on. Japan is growing at 1, one to 2% if we had sat here a year ago. We haven't seen something like that in 7 to 10 or maybe even 15 years. Mm -hmm. Europe is doing better than the United States. If we sat here a year ago, you would not have expected that. Uh, uh, and now you have a very pro-business president in France, which I think is a positive sign for all of Europe. Uh, and the United States has been chugging along at one and a half to two percent for the better part of eight years. But I want to point out the United States, the gr and despite the fact it's a long recovery, growth is half, literally half what it's been in the average recovery because it's been hampered by so many various things, some which I've already mentioned. So some of the risks on the horizon, you know, China does have imbalances in its financial system. Think of uh, MPLs, et cetera. You read about it all the time. It probably is a number, if I had to guess, a trillion dollars or north of that. The issue with that is they can handle that today. They have the wherewithal to do it. I, we find their officials very smart, very quick, very responsive to navigate, uh, and they're, reform they're trying to get the reforms in place that ha have those things that don't happen again. Uh, so even if, the, even if that's true, I th we think they can handle that. And then obviously you mentioned the unwinding of QE. We've never had QE like this before. We've never had unwinding like this before. Mm -hmm. Obviously that should Say, say something to you about the, the risk that might mean, because we've never lived through it before. But people focus on interest rates, uh, and I think you should always think when the interest rates is the why they're going up. If interest rates are going up, because and I'm talking about the United States now, and this would be true for East Europe too at one point, if interest rates are going up because the economy's strong, the strong economy is more important than the fact that rates are going up. And you've seen that in, you've seen that in the past. The rates can go up, mortgage rates can go up, housing prices can go up, uh, economies can do well. So I wouldn't necessarily say because rates are going up, it's going to shrink the economy. I think they've been very careful about raising rates. I think the reversal of the actual monetary, you know, selling securities in the marketplace, that, that's, I think when that happens of size or substance, uh, it could be a little more disruptive than people think. Again, if the economies are growing, it's not that big a deal. Um, but again, it's never happened before. And the other thing is we act like we know exactly how it's going to happen and we don't, okay? Because central banks don't always have a choice. I mean, the, they would like to provide all of you with certainty, but you cannot make things uncertain, certain that are uncertain. 
<laughs> and, and we don't know how this is all going to play out. And they, you know, if, if they have to raise rates faster or sell more or buy more. But the fact is they're very responsive and if they, they go into reverse course. <laughs> so you know, I'm, I, maybe I'm a little too optimistic, but you know, I think they'll wisely go about this process. The, the other thing about uh, the monetary supply, all the main buyers of sovereign debt of the last 10 years, think of financial institutions, central banks, foreign exchange managers, uh, uh, institutions that had to for a whole bunch of different reasons, requirements, that is over. They will become net sellers now. So it, that, that is a very different world when you, that you have to operate them. You have, that's a big change in the tide. The tide is going out, it's not coming in, or how, how we look at that, so. Well, on that uh, rather optimistic note, I would like to end the session. Thank you very much. Thank you all, and thank you for coming to Paris. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Jimmy Diamond. Thank you, Stuart Gulliver, for having participated to this session and uh, give uh, very optimistic views on the relaunching of the growth and uh, very optimistic views also on the way you will consider Paris in the context of the Brexit. You are more than welcome, Mr. Diamond, as well as Mr. Gulliver. And um, so we, uh, we will make a photo of uh, the participants, but um, I will ask all the participants here to go uh, outside for the cocktail because we have to switch the room to prepare the lunch and welcome our Prime Minister at uh, one o'clock very precisely. You, can, uh, you will be able to come in the room back at uh, 12.45 uh, if you could be the most precise as possible. Thank you to everybody. <laughs>